Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Ramona. I'm the sales executive for Coral Expeditions. And uh, today we're actually going to be joined by some of our expedition team as well. So um, we have the pleasure of two of our expert expedition team who will be joining myself. Um, so I am a Cairns local. Um, I am uh, born and bred here in Cairns um, and been with the company for a couple of years now. So um, Coral Expeditions though has been around for around 35 years. Um, and we've pretty much had one purpose and that's just to take groups of um, like-minded explorers to all of those remote parts of the world uh, with expert guidance and that warm hospitality. So as you'll see from our two fantastic gentlemen who'll be joining us soon, uh, we definitely have that nice warm relaxed um, crew environment on board. Um, so being Australian flagged as well is one of our other major highlights. Um, so Australian flagged, Australian crewed, um, and that's one of the things that makes us very unique as well. So today, sit back, um, take you on a little bit of a journey of the Kimberley, and we're gonna be joined by, as I mentioned, our expedition team, who are gonna take you on a bit of a story um, through this amazing uh, ancient land of the Kimberley. So we operate our Kimberley expeditions uh, annually. Um, so from Darwin to Broome or Broome to Darwin, um, and at various times throughout the year. So the gentleman will also touch on some of those um, best times to see, so you know, dry versus wet and things like that. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna hand you over to our expedition team. Uh, so we've got Jamie Anderson, who's our expedition leader. So hello, Jamie. Hi everybody. Uh, yes, I've been with, uh, with Coral Expeditions for 19 years now, and uh, uh, I enjoy every minute of uh, traveling around uh, showing people uh, the Kimberley. And then we also have Ian Morris, uh, one of our fantastic guest lecturers. Hi everyone. Yes, I'm uh, a Northern Territory local. I've uh, been up here all my working life and uh, I've been with uh, Coral Expeditions about the same length of time as Jamie. And uh, yeah, I spend most of my time in the bush. I'm more terrestrial than I am marine. Uh, but uh, uh, with Coral Expeditions, you get a little bit of everything. And uh, I find every trip we do is uh, an amazing experience for me. It, you never, ever get sick of it. Well, we might as well start off with uh, leaving uh, Darwin and heading across the uh, Bonaparte Gulf. And we end up uh, on our first day or our last day, depending on uh, uh, which journey you're doing, uh, at uh, King George Falls. Uh, it is an ancient land. You've only got to look at it. Uh, you can find the King George Falls uh, streaming as it is in this particular uh, uh, photo, or you can uh, find it without any water at all. But one thing that doesn't change is the fact that the scenery is just incredible. And that's uh, a great little view of, of the, uh, the Kimberley Plateau, which is a great big sandstone tabletop uh, geological formation that's been sort of uplifted way back in history, uh, well above sea level. And, uh, and it's slowly eroding back down towards sea level, a long, slow process. And this is one of the most spectacular parts of it. And uh, yeah, you, as Jamie said, you can see it when it's thundering because it, there's a lot of runoff in the wet season. So our first trips of the year, uh, we see this runoff coming over places like King George Falls. It's really stunning, but it doesn't take too long. And the wet season rain has drained off the top of that sandstone plateau and it all slowly quietens down. There's still a lot of fresh water seeping through that rock into the salt water and the, the water you're looking at there is, is the ocean actually, it goes right up to the foot of the falls. Very exciting and, and stunningly beautiful place. This uh, uh, is the Anjo Peninsula uh, or Vansittart Bay and Vansittart Bay uh, was named by uh, one of the explorers, uh, uh, one of the most important navigators that ever uh, worked in Australia. His name was Philip Parker King. And uh, he came down into this region uh, in 1819. Uh, this plane, of course, wasn't there then. Uh, this is uh, an accident of uh, war, if you like, uh, in 1942. Uh, and uh, this is a great walk across a uh, mud um, bank or mud area and uh, all of a sudden you find this incredible uh, uh, plane that's still in pretty good nick. 
Jar Island uh, is down at the bottom end of Vansittart Bay, quite close to Anjo Peninsula. And here you, you walk up to some of the most uh, magnificent uh, um, Gion Gion artwork and uh, certainly uh, magnificent in its, uh, uh, in its viewing. It's also like the Kimberley, it, it's, it's like time forgot it. Um, there's been human beings associated with this landscape for, well, they think at least 65,000 years now. Um, but it's had very little disturbance from modern man. So everywhere we go, like the area we're looking at now, Jar Island, it, it, it's all in pristine state. It's still the same as uh, when Philip Parker King went past in, in 1820. So um, one of the best things about the Kimberley is day after day, we're seeing um, original Australia that hasn't been modified by modern human beings. And, uh, and on top of that, we get to see what the very earliest human beings did. And some of this artwork you're looking at here, um, they say is well beyond 20,000 years old. Some of our, our earliest forms of art, as Jamie just said. And uh, Jamie and I have been taking groups of people into these kind of places very gently, so we don't disturb anything, we don't wear anything out, uh, and having a look at some of the oldest records of human history on the planet, let alone in Australia. And the other thing, of course, uh, Ian, is the fact that uh, uh, in the future, the, the local... Uh, uh, Indigenous people are going to be there and they're going to be uh, uh, assisting uh, our groups and taking them in to show mm. them this art. And I think that's going to be a, a really exciting part uh, to this cruising. Mm. And, and one of the, the novel things about this art is, I mean, we look at it as, as, as Westerners and it looks like sort of paintings on a rock. If you're there with an Indigenous person, they tell you the inside story. They tell you what all the symbolic meaning is inside this art looks fairly basic when you first see it, uh, and then you realise how complex it is and what a fantastic human history record each of these little art pieces is. So our passengers, uh, often when they, uh, they go to the first art sites, it's, it's um, just art to them. By the end of the trip, they're really excited about uh, all the different forms and all the different stories and representations of Australia's human history. Um, and it really, really uh, gets you excited. There is an option uh, to uh, take a flight uh, up onto the Mitchell uh, Plateau and up to the Mitchell Falls. This is done by helicopter. It's done from different areas uh, within the Kimberley, uh, much the same distance away. Uh, and uh, in this particular case, uh, it's uh, done from uh, uh, Prince Frederick Harbour. The helicopter uh, journey is incredible in its uh, uh, in its entirety, just having a look at the at the landscape below, uh, including the rivers, including the mangrove areas, including the the rocky uh, escarpments, is uh, one of the most exciting things that you can uh, uh, enjoy. And once you get up on the top, of course, you've got these incredible falls, the Mitchell Falls, and the helicopters are the uh, the true Trojans, if you like, uh, beautifully uh, flown by, uh, uh, by Heli Spirit and the, the pilots give a great commentary and certainly know their stuff. And as you can see, uh, it can be varying in whether or not it's uh, uh, pouring over the falls or just trickling over the falls. It doesn't really matter. It really has an ancient look about it. The yes. other areas, of course, that it does go from is Winyalkin. And uh, down in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see uh, Winyalkin and the beach. Uh, we're actually uh, having uh, drinks there. Uh, we see that uh, and we have a look at the sunset, which is directly out to the west. And uh, quite a beautiful place to go for a wander uh, late in the afternoon sun. We get access to these remote places um, with our special explorer vessels. Um, to take us from the ship to the shore. And, uh, and again, we're able to do all this without leaving an impact. Uh, people get pristine photos of nature. Um, and it sort of caters for everybody's interests, the people who are interested in landscape, people who are interested in, in vegetation and plants and, and, and unique endemic species, people interested in uh, wildlife. We see tracks of all sorts of rare animals on the sand beaches when we go ashore. Um, there's something for everybody. 
and uh, our job is to uh, alert people to what's there and, and what to look for. And then when they see these things, uh, we, hopefully we, we can provide more information on each individual thing that they're looking at. And uh, as I said earlier, each, each time Jamie and I do these trips, every trip is different. And, and we see new and unique things. And we've done hundreds of them, literally hundreds of them uh, between us. And yet every trip uh, is just as exciting as, as the first one f for us. So uh, you can imagine how the uh, guests feel when they, they get into a place that hasn't even got human footprints um, and they're able to explore a bit of natural Australia un unaltered. So what you're looking at there is just perfect examples of that. We quite often find you know, new little art sites. We quite often find uh, a, a northern quoll sitting out on a ledge just for a few people who are with us at that particular time. It's, uh, it's always amazing and it always uh, is different as Ian said. The, uh, the, the geological you formations you can see there are uh, quite exciting. Um, we call this elephant leg weathering. It's, it's softer layers within the sandstone plateau geology and these softer layers, when they're down close to the salt water, you get this funny weathering effect where um, cracks appear and then columns develop and then cave systems, real labyrinths of caves all interconnected. And a lot of the wildlife in the Kimberley uh, is nocturnal. So a lot of animals like possums and geckos and frogs, all sorts of things, refuge in those sort of formations during the daytime. So we we're able to take our guests for a little wander through these amazing uh, tunnels um, with our little head torches on and we can see all these neat little animals uh, staring down at us. Um, and that's, that's just another aspect of the ecology of the Kimberley. And you, you've got this, this great um, labyrinth as Ian spoke about where you can wander through uh, the, the cave systems. You come out and uh, uh, you have these different lightings and it's very spectacular from a point of view of uh, cameras and uh, taking photographs. You get uh, the sandstones, have all these swirls and things in them. And uh, the bottom right left hand corner there is indicative of some of the areas around Swift Bay where you walk onto the sandstone and it just looks as though people have been painting the rocks. And people have been painting the rocks, so as you can see on the right hand side. Um, so you can also see different eras in the, in the Aboriginal occupation of the Kimberley over that huge uh, part of human history. And so there are different eras and, and different styles. And, and these, uh, the one we're seeing on the right there is a, a, a Wanjana uh, example. Uh, the Wanjina art is the most recent art era and uh, we come across these Wanjina uh, examples of art. That's, that's bigger than uh, uh, the human body. It's painted. It's a huge painting, that particular one. Um, and right down to little tiny things and, and battle scenes and all sorts of things that uh, have taken place in the human history of the Kimberley. Uh, we see it reflected in the art like that. Prince Frederick Harbour is, to me, the most exciting harbour anywhere in the world. Uh, there's no hanging bridges, there's no ferries. Uh, there's just this wonderful area where reflection is spectacular. It's abounded by the uh, mangrove areas. We call them mangal communities. And this is where we do get a chance to, to have a look at uh, some of the uh, some of the wildlife that's around. We get a lot of bird life coming out early in the morning. We also have uh, crocodiles coming out and sunning themselves on the banks uh, as the tide goes down. These tidal forests are some of the best in the world, some of the most diverse. I think uh, the uh, Southeast Asian region beats us by a few species, but we have many different types of mangrove trees forming these tidal forests. Ideal homes, as Jamie just said, for things like saltwater crocodiles. And then over the years, we've noticed um, that the wildlife uh, has become sort of used to human um, intrusion, if you like, to the point where some of the animals, like this particular little saltwater crocodile here, to be about 
1.5 metres, um, they actually seem to enjoy us. And uh, they come out to meet us and they swim around and look at us and uh, they have no uh, evil intent. They uh, don't mind getting photographed. And then when we leave, they go back to whatever it was they were doing before. And it gives people um, a whole different view of, of an animal. I mean, what we're taught about a crocodile is an animal that's, that's there to kind of eat humans. But in actual fact, uh, we're not on its normal diet list. And uh, if you have a relationship with these animals, like that one there, um, time after time, Jamie and I see this animal and his mates swim out and, and enjoy our company. Um, and it gives a whole different aspect to Australian wildlife, really, particularly the things that we fear most. Um, and uh, then we can start to realise the kind of relationships that the Indigenous people of this country had prior to us. Um, we, we fear our own shadows almost when we're in the bush. Uh, whereas Aboriginal people are very comfortable around things like saltwater crocodiles. And uh, it, this, this gives us an opportunity to actually see um, nature as it's supposed to be seen. And uh, yeah, the, the animals are seem to enjoy it as much as we do. Of course, history is, is, uh, goes way back, as Ian's uh, been talking about. It goes back well beyond 65,000 years or thereabouts. But it's in the last 65,000 years that people have been moving in these areas. In this particular case, uh, Philip Parker King uh, came into this area in around 1820. And, and he, uh, uh, he named that lovely little tour on the, on the right-hand side there. He called it Indian Head. Uh, he also called it the Nine Pin. Uh, and the Nine Pin because it reminded him of the game of Skittles. But it's the reflections that we see nowadays. And of course, we, we love to uh, uh, have a look around the area. We try and spend some time on shore if possible. Uh, there's magnificent uh, Wanjana art, just small areas that you find every so often, as I said before. Uh, and then all of a sudden you find uh, that everybody's down and getting dirty and uh, looking up at the, at the artwork. Uh, the biggest problem we find is having to get you all up again. <laughs> As Jamie said too, the, the, the seasons are, are constantly changed. We've got two sort of extremes in Northern Australia, very wet, wet. Uh, and that's an example of a good wet season or post wet season photo, the uh, King Cascade there. And, uh, and then it, tapers right off to a very dry, dry season, right through till about October, November. Um, and all the plants and all the animals uh, are geared up to be able to cope with those two extremes in one year, very wet and very dry. So it doesn't really matter what time of year you see the Kimberley, um, the animals and the plants are all carrying out strategies uh, that carry them through from one season to the next, from one extreme to the next. And, uh, so in many ways, it's just as interesting to see the Kimberley in the far end of the dry season and just see what the plants and the animals are doing, um, preparing for the next uh, influx of fresh water to, uh, to hit the Kimberley Plateau and then gush over the sides like we're seeing there. So it's a land of extremes. As you can see, the land of extremes. Uh, uh, you can see the differences in the water levels at this particular, in all these particular uh, shots. It's also a great place for wildlife. Uh, it has its own small uh, uh, microclimates, if you like. And so you have these incredible walls of, of moss, the incredible walls of ferns. And when the water levels start to go right down, you start to have animals wanting to come in and drink, wanting to come in and bathe. And of course, uh, um, when the tides ride out, you really do have some uh, exciting times, even trying to get the explorer in close to, uh, uh, to the uh, walls. And you have these massive mud bars. And of course, when you have the mud banks, you have uh, uh, crocodiles. In this particular case, we had uh, uh, a very large male and what we think was probably a female. And uh, uh, they were just on the mud bank uh, it was the first time we'd seen this sort of attitude in the Kimberley. Uh, again, when it comes down to it, as Ian said, every time we take you somewhere in the Kimberley, we find something different. Well, 
Well, Jamie, you might want to tell us the rest of this story you started at the beginning there about uh, old Captain King. Philip Parker King. Well, the careening bay is very historic. It hasn't changed in 200 years, and I do mean 200 years. This year is the 200th anniversary of this particular uh, tree being etched in time. And Philip Parker King came to careen his boat. That's to uh, check it out. He was having some problems. And uh, he landed on the beach. He pulled the, um, the HMC Mermaid up onto the uh, beach and they started to uh, uh, pull the planks off the, off the hull. Behind the beach was this incredible tree, this huge boab tree. And he'd been asked to leave his mark. And as you can see, he left his mark, all right. Uh, they put HMC Mermaid 1820 on the tree. And as the tree has grown over the next 200 years, the writing has also increased. And of course, nowadays, there's a ballwalk there so that we don't impact the area around the tree. And Captain right King left his mark in a few other ways too, didn't he? He, uh, he had a, uh, uh, a naturalist on board, uh, Robert Cunningham. Uh, Alan Cunningham, sorry, yep. Alan Cunningham yep. and Alan Cunningham, uh, while they were uh, working on the vessel, he was wandering around in the bush looking at all the amazing wildlife and, and plant life. And so as a result of that, that extended stay he had there, he was able to describe a whole lot of uh, plants and a whole lot of animals, um, which now have their, their scientific type locality in Careening Bay. One of them's the frill neck lizard. Um, Australia's famous frill neck lizard. It was first uh, known to science from that point there, Careening Bay um, by uh, Alan Cunningham. Montgomery Reef, there isn't, uh, this is an icon which you cannot miss. Uh, in the old days, we used to walk on the surface. Today, we use the Zodiacs and the Explorer to go up what we call the river here and um, we go as close as we can to the uh, to the sides of this incredible reef massive in size and the water just continually cascades off this reef the entire time we're there sometimes we get there just as it's coming out of the uh, out of the water uh, and sometimes the, it's been out of water for hours and we get there and if it's been a king spring tide then we we can see almost five meters of the reef out of the water. Having a look at the, the, the reef critters uh, and reef invertebrates, it's an impressive sight at the best of times. And the color, while it may not be all that colorful at, um, when there's not a lot of water off it, as that water starts to seep down and go further down, you start to see the magnificent uh, colors of the sponges and, and the different um, marine critters that are there. You also have the chance to, to spot little things in the little nooks and crannies as you get close in the Zodiacs and the Explorer. Things like blue ringed octopus. Occasionally you'll find turtles uh, caught up on the top of the uh, reef. They're all right, they'll be fine. The water will come in and, and take them uh, back into the water again. You get uh, uh, sea snakes and in the water itself you get feeding turtles everywhere. And that's what people are excited to see, the wildlife. But it's that incredible sight of that reef with water just cascading off it. Another classic place we go to uh, is this Doubtful Bay region. Um, and one of the, uh, the features of Doubtful Bay is uh, the rock art and incredible galleries of, of uh, beautiful rock art. Quite often we're able to meet up with the traditional owners of this area uh, and they're able, because they're active, active uh, rock art sites and constantly refreshed, as they say, uh, the, the stories and, and uh, legends are uh, celebrated each year and uh, somebody's of the clan group is allocated to refresh the actual artwork. Um, so it, it's a great place to, uh, to learn about uh, Australia's early human history and, and uh, how people lived on that wild, rugged landscape. And, uh, and art, art really reflects it. 
And to be able to meet the traditional owners in these areas too is, is a wonderful privilege. So uh, it's it's stunning landscape and it, it's an incredible human history as well. Horizontal Falls, uh, a great shot taken by Ian uh, uh, from uh, the air, obviously, and uh, uh, you can see the two uh, the two gaps, the larger gap um, at the beginning here and in the foreground, and then the the more narrow gap at the back. This is always an exciting place to go to, and quite often is the one reason people have travelled to the Kimberley for ten days, if you can believe that. The thing about it is that uh, we take people through in zodiacs, through the first area, and you can see uh, uh, this um, turbulent water where uh, uh, you're one with nature. And it, it's an enthralling trip, a journey taken through this area. But just remember that once you go through, you've actually, you've actually got to turn around and come back out of there. So just uh, reverse that and see what it must be like coming through that turbulence. It's really exciting and uh, people come back, if they, they may look frightened when they're going in, but when they come back out, they've got a smile as big as, uh, as, big as a uh, sun. Also, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a drowned mountain range, if you like, where, where the sea level rose uh, you know, many thousands of years ago up to its present level and uh, kind of surrounded this, uh, this skeleton of a, of a a mountain range, they used to call it the King Leopold range. Aboriginal people call it Miluindi. They, it, it's undergoing a name change now because King Leopold apparently never ever got anywhere near this place. So relatively inappropriate. He wasn't a very nice person either, I understand. But um, the Aboriginal people have got all sorts of um, beautiful uh, historic stories about this place. As you can imagine um, here, the bit we're looking at now gets almost a, a 13 metre tidal range at certain times of the year. Uh, about the second biggest uh, tidal range in the world. Um, so you can imagine there's a lot of water trying to squeeze through narrow spaces. And it's very exciting, as Jamie just said, when you're in a little rubber ducky uh, going flat out. Um, it, it's it's experience that, uh, that stays with people for the rest of their lives. And it is on a lot of people's bucket list, but even um, people with great expectations come back and say, it's far better than I thought it was going to be. And you can always so, uh, uh be assured that the crew member who's taking you through in the Zodiac is enjoying it just as much as you are. <laughs> the Buccaneer Archipelago, uh, of course, uh, named by Philip Parker King uh, and uh, uh, named after the old Buccaneer himself, uh, William Dampier, uh, has some exciting places to visit. Um, this particular area is Naris Point, and uh, it geologically is is just uh, the most incredible place you can you can visit and look at and and photograph. Uh, and I I don't think there's another piece of rock anywhere. Maybe uh, maybe Whitnam Gorge, but I don't think there's too much uh, uh, better than the rock features that you get around this particular area. And this is close to uh, Coolan Island uh, uh, and uh, the iron ore mine on Coolan Island. Uh, it's also close to the old Cockatoo Island. And uh, it's got so much. It's also close to, to an area that is um, uh, from the indigenous people. Uh, it was one of the earliest uh, shelters that uh, can be found anywhere along the coastline, around 28, 29,000 years quite exceptional when you uh, think about this particular area. The geomorphologists uh, tell us that the Kimberley uh, was once separated from mainland Australia as a kind of a, a big uh, geological island, uh, completely surrounded by ocean. Then, then at uh, another point in history, it reconnected with the Australian mainland and uh, Evidence of that is, is all around you on the Kimberley coastline and you're looking at it there too, where these amazing forces have jammed together what was once horizontal sedimentary rock, uh, jammed it against uh, other layers and it's buckled and twisted, been heated up. A lot of it's happened in a sort of a semi-molten state. And what we have today is all these amazing colours in layers, all twisted and bent. And as Jamie said, this is probably the best example, most 
visually stunning example of all of it, the Nares Point Formation, as we call it. Um, but it's all along the Kimberley Coast uh, in the areas uh, where the island crushed up against the mainland. Placid Pete Islands, uh, a group of four islands. Uh, and uh, once again, in the old days, we used to take, uh, take groups of people walking on the island. Today, we would rather take you in, in Zodiacs. And, and when it comes down to it, you see more in the Zodiacs than you ever did when you were walking. Because every time you walked around, you frightened the birds off nests. And, and of course, that allowed predatory uh, silver gulls to come in and take uh, eggs. Now, that doesn't happen. And so you have this incredible sighting of the brown boobies. It's the largest colony of brown boobies anywhere in the world, it's believed. And you have these wonderful, white, fluffy chicks that are bigger than their parents, all sitting there, can't flap their wings yet because their wings are not really formed, but they're voracious feeders. And so they rely on their parents to come and give them as much food as possible. And as they get uh, older, they get larger and larger. And, and then of course, they eventually are told they better fly, otherwise they're not being fed anymore. And that's always a bit of a circus to watch because they crash into the water, they crash into the explorer, they crash into the, uh, uh, into the larger vessels. At the same time, it's a great place to find the green turtle. And uh, we find a large number of the small green turtle feeding uh, in the sea grasses within the little lagoons at the back. That's always exciting. And that's what people really love to see is the, is the turtle coming up to the surface and taking that big breath. And of course, it's a place where you might end up with anything up to around 5,000 uh, breeders coming in per uh, annum. And uh, it's mainly green turtles, but occasionally you get, uh, uh, you get the, the endemic flatback coming in. These islands were once part of the mainland uh, until, you know, about seven, six, five thousand years ago when sea levels rose to their present level. And now they're about 40 k's offshore. And uh, because of that, their isolation, um, th their predators are very low. So th these sort of places um, are densely populated with seabirds. And, and we see all through the dry season, we see different waves of different species of seabirds coming in and breeding en masse raising their chicks in a few weeks and then they're gone and another another lot will come in and so it doesn't really matter when we go there there's always plenty of breeding seabirds and uh, also it's it's a stop-off point for the migrant birds of Australia so the ones that go up into the northern hemisphere um, to breed uh, and then come back down for uh, five six months in Australia on the mainland a lot of them come through these Lacerpede Islands and they'll rest and regain their strength after a long flight or prepare for a long flight. So we see a mixture of our local seabirds and we see these wonderful international migrants there as well. Now this is, this is the part I like. I'm, I'm an animal person and uh, we certainly get to see a lot of interesting animals, all sorts, mammals, birds, reptiles, marine, fish, and creatures. Uh, and you never know what you're going to see. The, uh, it, it, the Kimberley is a great place for, for surprises. Um, I've learned that over a long period of time. But uh, what you're looking at there in the top uh, left uh, are flying fish. There's a few varieties of them. Um, but we see them um, flying out from the uh, bow of our boat as we uh, cruise along. And uh, at night, their, their colours are stunning. They, uh, they're all, all individually coloured. And, and uh, yeah, that photo just shows you a, a little group that were playing around at the back of our vessel one night. Um, just a variation in their, their beautiful colour. The, the bird below them is a whistling kite. Um, we see those virtually every day of the trip. They're a sort of low level predator. Up on the middle top is the uh, short eared rock wallaby. That's a little female with a a little pouch young looking out into the world down there. And uh, we see those all along the coastline in the sandstone formations. And uh, they're getting quite used to us too. Whales, uh, that's a humpback whale breaching. We see those quite often uh, as they migrate up from the Southern Ocean and give birth to their young around the Kimberley region and then head south 
uh, towards the end of the season. Uh, up there's a little hatchling of one of our uh, green turtles. Um, again, we see, if we don't see the actual hatchlings, we see the little tracks coming up out of the sand, erupting out of the nest and down to the, the water's edge. And of course, down the bottom right there is our old mate, the saltwater crocodile. They look pretty mean, but actually um, that we're finding they, they come out and visit us, they kind of get used to us. Um, and uh, they're not the animal they're, de they're depicted to be. So again, people get a chance to see the other side of the saltwater crocodile on these trips. Um, and that's, uh, that's just some of the creatures that we see. Vegetation, of course, is, uh, is always different from the beginning of our uh, uh, journeys in April to the end in, uh, uh, in October or, or late September. And so you get a lot of fruiting bodies uh, and the, in the, uh, uh, they have some incredible scientific names, not a lot of, uh, not a lot of uh, common names. Sometimes the, the top right hand corner, uh, left hand corner, I should say, is uh, uh, looked like Dutch clogs. And so quite often they're called the Dutch clog plant. But it has a uh, incredible uh, scientific name, which has changed over periods of time, and now is a thing called Tabernay Montana, uh, which is is a mouthful. You get uh, below it, you have the the seeds of the uh, great panda, uh, the yellow panda, which is uh, a beautiful uh, plant when it's out in in the yellow uh, flowers. It's related to the eucalypt, so it has those beautiful. Um, uh, stamens. You have the uh, kingfisher. This one is a sacred kingfisher sitting in the mangrove. And we're lucky enough to occasionally do some uh, bird watching tours within the mangroves themselves. And that's when you do see these characters uh, uh, feeding on the mud below. And of course you get uh, uh, the grasshoppers coming out uh, at different times, but certainly usually just as the wet has finished. And, and they come out and they're going for uh, the plants that are around. As the wet season diminishes and you start to dry up, you get these magnificent uh, giant water lilies that grow in the river systems where we uh, visit. Places like Mitchell Falls, places like uh, uh, Prince Regent River and, and Camp Creek. And of course, uh, during the time Pink Mulla Mulla comes out in flower, and that's the bottom right hand corner. And you end up with the common crow butterflies aggregating while they feed on, on the stems of those. It's always exciting and it changes all the time from, uh, uh, from one month to the other. That's why, as Ian said, you can never get bored of coming into the Kimberley. Jamie and Ian, um, that was definitely an amazing overview of the Kimberley. Um, I guess, yeah, that gives a, a bit of an idea of the guest experience on shore as well. So, I mean, as Jamie and um, Ian had just mentioned, you know, we do have various ways that we do see the Kimberley and we always try to make it as immersive as possible as well. So whilst there's some fantastic scenery for everybody to see, uh, we know that our, our guests that travel with us do love that bit of education as well. So. Um, that's one of the main highlights that we do try um, as often as possible. So um, there's always an adventure to be had. Um, and the way we do that is in small groups um, and always with an expert expedition leader, um, usually Jamie or Ian. So, yeah. Um, so as you would have heard Ian mention before, we do have our explorer tenders. So these are actually purpose built for our ships. So um, depending on the ships will depend on the number of explorers that we do have. Um, you can see this one's actually a coral discoverer, but um, they're designed so that they're hydraulically lowered down from our vessel uh, from a platform. And you can board those, like you can see just on that left bottom image there, um, almost directly from our back deck. So really easy to get on and off those explorers. Um, you're not having to sort of clamber up downstairs or ladders or things like that. So um, really quite easy. And that also enables us to get into those um, little tight rivers in Montgomery or up in the King Cascade and, and areas like that. So um, definitely a highlight for us. Um, if it's with our Coral Adventurer, we would have the two Explorer tenders which would operate simultaneously. So I'm sure Ian and Jamie, you would totally agree that these Explorers are definitely a bonus to have on board. 
amazing vessels. And uh, yeah, they get you right in, um, in comfort, in safety, right up against the things you came to see. And, and uh, I don't think there's any other company that does that sort of thing or is capable of doing that sort of thing. So uh, yeah, it really makes it a unique experience. Yeah. And the other thing, too. Ian, is Thanks. that um, I think the other thing, Ian, is the fact that uh, when you've got uh, all the people in the one vessel or in the two vessels there, you're all seeing the, the, the things that you're spotting in the water or on the shore together. Uh, you're not missing out. Uh, and I think that that's, uh, uh, that's incredible uh, and very important uh, when you're going into places such as the Kimberley. Yeah, absolutely. And also, I guess you are spending quite a long day sometimes in the Kimberley, which can get quite warm. So having that um, covered canopy on the Explorer tenders is a huge bonus for some protection. Um, but then also we do have that marine toilet on the back. So it means that, you know, if you've got to go when you're miles away, at least you've got the opportunity to, um, uh, to not be detracted and having to go back to the vessel. So huge highlight there as well. Um, and whilst the experience on board is um, very relaxed, we do have a really um, high standard of service on board. Um, we've got that warm Australian hospitality that I mentioned, um, but all of our meals are chef prepared on board. Um, very high quality food. <laughs> so it's a good thing that we've got all of those hikes and things um, to keep you along the way. Um, we've got multiple bar areas on board as well. Um, of course, all meals are inclusive. Um, and we do also include at lunchtime and dinner time, we do include um, house beers, wines, um, and some house spirits as well. Um, but then we've got multiple different evenings throughout. We might have welcome drinks or captain's welcomes, things like that, um, that we can have on board other areas of the ship. So uh, we've got our outdoor dining options, but then we do also have um, our fantastic indoor dining as well um, that you can utilize. So we'll see some of those uh, interior shots on our vessels when I'll go through them for you shortly. Um, but one of the highlights, which I'm definitely sure the guys would agree on, is um, our open bridge policy. So guests absolutely love to go up into the bridge. Um, we do welcome guests to go in. You can see up on the right hand side there, that's our bridge on the Coral Adventurer. Um, and yeah, Captain is always um, welcome for anyone to come in. Um, you can chart the courses with them, learn a bit about the history, um, or if you've feel like just having you know, a game on board, you can kick back, relax, um, or just enjoy the, the multiple outdoor spaces that we've got. So there's plenty of opportunity to find your own little piece of quiet time on board if you wish, um, either on the sun decks or the promenade decks, um, or up in the bridge deck lounges, or if you feel like watching one of the presentations, uh, we've always got an expert team doing those presentations on board up in our guest lounges. So um, plenty to do and see along the way. Um, so you've got our three vessels here. Um, so the Coral Discoverer is our, our smallest vessel of the fleet. So she has the 36 staterooms. And then we have our newly introduced Coral Adventurer who has 60 staterooms. And then joining us uh, at the end of the year for her first voyage uh, in January, June, is the Coral Geographer. who will be the sister ship to our Coral Adventurer and she'll have the 60 staterooms as well. So um, all of our vessels are outward facing staterooms. Um, so none of them have uh, internal at all. Um, so all of them do have a view of some description. So you can see that's her beautiful Coral Discoverer. Um, as I mentioned, really relaxed um, dining experience inside. Um, plenty of space inside as well. And then up in your staterooms, you've got your bridge deck balcony stateroom that you can see on the right there um, with amazing views through that balcony. Um, and then our next categories down, you'll have the uh, promenade deck um, and then the main deck. Um, and then this particular vessel here is our Coral Adventurer. Uh, so she's the one with the 60 staterooms. Once again, that beautiful relaxed dining on board. Um, and then this one you can see is our bridge deck balcony suite. Um, so that's a spectacularly large suite on board that one, um, 55 plus square meters, so plenty of space in there. Um, and then our Coral Geographer, which will be the sister ship. And once again, with the 60 staterooms, um, she'll also have the bridge deck suites on board, but um, they'll be slightly smaller around the 35 to 36 square metres uh, with those fantastic um, external bathroom views. So um, fantastic um, vessels um, built for comfort, um, but plenty of space just to relax and, and unwind. 
Um, we do have actually, I forgot to mention the two vessels, um, the Coral Adventure and the Geographer. Um, they do have an elevator on board. Um, we do use those for just convenience purposes only, um, but they are a feature with those two vessels. So any other highlights? Also, also in, those lovely there, guys? <laughs> in those lovely circumstances, we uh, get to uh, give presentations on uh, the things we're likely to see uh, during our trip. And so we're often able to introduce people to areas before we get there and look at the main features and the exciting parts to, to keep an eye out for. And sometimes we do follow-ups as well of an evening, uh, talking about what we saw and the meaning of this and that and, and adding more information. So um, all that's able to be done in very, very uh, comfortable circumstances. As far as I'm concerned as a guest lecturer, it's wonderful to be able to deliver that sort of information uh, in between our shore visits um, in such a nice way. Yeah, it's also, also so we're able to, I think also the, the great thing about um, the company is that we're able to uh, vary things from time to time, um, not only in the Kimberley, but it, wherever else we go. And every so often we'll go to someplace new, which is an expedition in itself. And of course, um, that means that even the expedition team are going to that place for the first time. So it becomes a, an all in uh, uh, all in experience and I think that's uh, one of the great things about this company that uh, I've found anyway. Mm. Agreed. Yeah, I mean especially like areas like the Kimberley, um, it's obviously pretty important to have that flexible itinerary where you know you've got to figure out the mercy of the tides and things so yeah to be able to shift about. Most that's important. Yeah. I guess that leads us to um, another important thing then, gentlemen, um, some top tips for everyone to make sure that they, um, they do pack. Um, so of course, you know, your necessities up in the Kimberley is your, your sun protection, um, your hats, you've got your cameras, your binoculars, of course, to spot all of those fantastic wildlife. Um, but then also pack for all occasions. So, you know, you will have some wet landings and some dry landings. Um, so just make sure you've got those um, spare hiking shoes or wet weather shoes. Um, and then also bring along a spray jacket or something like that, um, because you never know um, what type of conditions you may end up with. And of course, if you're planning on doing some of the challenging hikes, you know, get yourself prepared beforehand. Um, that way you can make the most of the experience. Um, and then we always suggest as well, make sure to arrive in um, a minimum of a day prior um, and then don't plan to leave at least a, a at least a day after, um, just to allow that little bit of flexibility with, you know, departures coming in. We'd hate for you to miss flights and things like that. So, um, yeah, just keep that, keep that in mind. Um, any other top tips, gentlemen, of what the, our guests should pack? I think you've got it up there in, in number two there, bring a yeah. jacket for winter months. Uh, the Kimberley, under most circumstances, is beautiful and warm, but uh, if we're travelling up by the King George River in the middle of winter, uh, the sun may not be quite up uh, at the particular time that we depart. And by God, it gets cold in there sometimes. Uh, I've even seen Ian wearing a, uh, a jacket. <laughs> it has happened, yes. Also, um, there are insects up there in the Kimberley, but very few. We don't have much trouble with mosquitoes and sand flies and things like that, uh, as, as a lot of people expect we will. Um, but it's remarkably uh, free from those sort of things. But it's always worth having a bit of bug protection. We supply that on the vessels anyway before we do our, our excursions. So it's not a real problem. But the camera and the binoculars and whatever else you need to, to get as close a look at the things you're interested in as possible are definitely worth uh, bringing with you and, and taking on each trip. Yep, absolutely. I think my favourite one is that first one. Just make sure you pack your sense of adventure. <laughs> mm. <laughs> And the smile. Yeah. <laughs> Love it, guys. Well, um, as you would have seen, that's our, an amazing Kimberley adventure. But um, we do have plenty of other amazing um, expeditions that you can do. Um, if you do wish to join any of our cruises, there is a couple of options that can be adjoined. So um, jump on the website or speak to your travel agent about which particular expeditions you can adjoin. Um, and then you do receive that 10% saving off those cruises. Um, so just keep that at the back of your mind. 
Um, we've got our Cape York and Arnhem Land. Um, we've got our Ningaloo or potentially um, a reef or depending on the time of the year that you're planning on going, there could be something different you can adjoin. So plenty of opportunities for exploration. So, um, thanks so much for, um, for joining us. Um, as I said, for any info, feel free to jump on our website um, and you can get more info about that. Um, but yeah, on behalf of myself and Jamie and Ian here, uh, we do thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.